We are in Champions League, man. That was my dilly next question. Dilly dong, come on. Into Sheringham, and so Sharon won it! I will love it if we beat them. Love it. This is the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast with Gary Kearney. Hello, welcome to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. My name is Gary Kernin. Joining me for this episode is Simon Clifford. Simon is somewhat of a pioneer when it comes to growth mindset for coaches and also technical development for young players. So as a young coach in England, he brought the Brazilian training techniques over to the UK in the 1990s with Brazilian soccer schools. He challenged how we worked and then how hard we worked he also moved on to non-league senior football with Garforth Town and then a role with Premier League club Southampton alongside Clive Woodward in 2004. So a number of players and coaches around the world and in the UK have been influenced by Simon's work and I was really excited to catch up with him to talk about not only his journey but also his perspective on today's game and things that were maybe looked upon with scepticism in the 1990s that are now commonplace in academies and clubs today and get his thoughts on it. So really, really enjoyed this. We'd love to hear your thoughts at Gary Kernin on Twitter, at Gary Kernin on Instagram. Before we begin, a quick reminder to our listeners to set aside five to 10 minutes today. Get on your computer or your phone and check out Sports Lab 360. We're excited about the work they are doing to help educate and develop players from a soccer IQ perspective. More to come at the halfway point with an exclusive Modern Soccer Coach podcast offer. Here's Simon. Enjoy. Simon, thanks so much for joining me today on the Modern Soccer Coach podcast. Really excited to have you on. Thanks very much, Gary. I'm glad to be here. So in 2019, you only have to click probably about three or four tweets deep on your timeline that you'll get a fixed versus growth mindset and you'll get a, a frame of, you know, traditional thinking against forward thinking. But, you know, in the 1990s, when I was coming up definitely as a player and starting as a coach, we were we were miles away from that there. And I was definitely in the camp of fixed mindset, idolizing the Brazilians, watching them, wishing I had their skill and ability and just basically bemoaning the fact that I was born in Northern Ireland and I was never going to get close to it. So you decided to take out a big loan, travel halfway around the world and go and actually find out what made them special. What was your inspiration behind that? Yeah, well, I think as with most of us, it probably goes back to when I was a kid. And, um, like most of us, again, football was my first love. I, love. I grew up on the terraces of Middlesbrough Football Club and loved every aspect of football. Age 11, the 1982 World Cup came in Spain. Then I saw the Brazilians and I saw an England team that in, in, in that World Cup was exciting. Um, but Brazil, who obviously didn't go on to win it, um, took my eye in the, the eye of most of those in the world. In, in those days, certainly in, in youth football, there was a lot of, well, you, you know, you can't do this and you mustn't do that and you mustn't do the other. Um, and a couple of years on from that World Cup, maybe about 84, I started to get a bit fed up with it. I decided to stop playing football and decided to take up an individual sport. So Seb Coe, Sebastian Coe is now head of the Olympics. I think he still is. He was in his pomp uh, then and I thought I'll be a runner. I thought if it's something against the clock, there's not so much going to be sort of, you know, getting constrained, you know. And so I, I got really into that um, over the years I became pretty good at it. In 89, just before I went off to university, I ran a UK age best for 10k on the road. And I came to university and studied sport. And it was there, I think, that I re-engaged with football. I also met a young lady who became my wife and um, really threw myself into my studies and took as many options as I could relating to football. So did the PGCE. Ended up getting offered a job while on my second teaching practice and took the job without thinking too much that I was going to end up in teaching. And in the time of that school, I ended up running football teams at uh, under nines, tens and elevens. Later we started 
and under eights. And um, I think some of the stuff that I'd been doing on the academic side during my degree, I sort of tried to bring to the fore in terms of skill acquisition and small sided games. Uh, I got hold of a fair bit of material from Holland, someone coaching in Italy. Um, I wrote to our FA and asked them if I could, if they know, knew where I could get any resources on Brazilian coaching or the Brazilian national team. And they wrote back to me, as you just said, and sort of said the Brazilians are nat uh, naturals. So, and I knew that couldn't be right. And I knew it wasn't right. And so that was a bit, a uh, bit of a dead end for that at that time. Um, but then during this period, Middlesbrough signed Juninho, who at the time was um, the Brazilian record transfer. He was Brazil's number 10 and he was the South American player of the year. And I thought, here we go. I've been into this sort of style since I was a boy. I wanted to coach it for the last couple of years or even understand why they move like they do where that comes from, uh, when do they begin learning, how do they learn. I thought, I've got to get to meet him. So I rang the club. Um, they weren't too keen on just, you know, putting any old person in touch with their new signing. But I persisted a little bit and ended up seeing where his dad sat at the Middlesbrough games. It wasn't too far away from me and my dad, me and my dad sat. And knowing a tiny bit of Spanish, I got talking to his dad. And through persistence, his dad eventually invited me over to their house. A long story short, him and I became very, very, very good friends. In fact, at that point, he didn't really uh, know too many people. And it was very different in terms of foreign players. I mean, the players were very much left on their own. So I, for him, became useful in all types of ways, from maybe running around, doing a bit of this, doing little jobs for his dad and... Yeah, so the big thing to me was I finally had someone I think I could talk to about maybe South American coaching. So each every night after finishing um, my practices in school with the kids, I'd drive off to Middlesbrough and spend more or less every night there for certainly large part of the 95-96 season, um, then into the, to the one the year after. And I'd sit and I'd write whatever he told me. How did they do this? What age did you do that? I got a lot from the materials I had from Ajax and some of that sort of Dutch orientated stuff, but this was mind blowing the things that he was telling me. And I'd drive home 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, excited, get to bed for a few hours, up and repeat. And that went on for a period. And then I ended up realizing that I was only just getting his perspective on it. So I said to him, look, I'd like to make a trip out to Brazil myself and sort of see in action some of the things that you're telling me. I'd had him down in Leeds, uh, working with the kids that we had, and, but I wanted to go out there. So I said to his dad, who, yeah, a great man, I said to Osvaldo, look, I'd like to meet Zico, I want to meet Kareka, some of the, the heroes I had, that was a bit innocent of me, but um, I said, I want to meet some of the great coaches, I want to meet Ronaldo's coach, I want to meet some of the coaches in Flamengo in Sao Paulo. And um, his dad said to me, you know, some of these guys are busy, he said, the players you mentioned, we haven't even met them, and my son's the but sort of, you know, he's the main player in Brazil at the minute. Uh, but that didn't put me off. I got a fax machine. I started faxing the Brazilian embassy, people in Brazil, and eventually set up this trip where I went out. And in the end, through Janinho, who got me into São Paulo Football Club, his club, I just had the most mind-blowing couple of months there on the first trip where everything he told me was true and more. Um, I met the players that I'd wanted to meet, but I went to some of the, the poorest clubs. I went to Sao Paulo in one of their training bases at the University of Sao Paulo. I, I actually lived in the stadium for, well, the, actually the majority of that trip. It was a sort of cockroach infested. It wasn't the best, but I was in heaven football wise. I'd come out in the morning, watch various age groups train, make notes, dictaphone. Uh, I was then over to Rio and doing stuff. Um, you see, I, I borrowed money from the teachers' union to do that. The BBC up in the north had knew that I was going out. They came with me and sort of did some filming, which ended up a documentary, a whole new ball game. But I once I saw, you see, we didn't qualify for the 1994 World Cup England, obviously. And um, this is about the year I've started coaching. You had a lot of 
talk about that we were as good as anywhere in this country and that our players were as good as anywhere and it was just that we couldn't perform on the you know on the big stage and this type of thing but when I went out there I mean a lot of what we have now in terms of our academies at the very top even if I talk about Man City's I'm still not sure that there's the level of detail or I'm just not sure it's quite at the, the level yet that I first saw there in Sao Paulo they had three or four training bases it was just phenomenal I mean what we're doing on nutrition here now we Forget the technical side, areas beyond that on sleep, just it was so forensic in its nature, much of it. And uh, I realised that if I had a, if I did have a care for English football myself, which I did, I loved football. My happiest family memories revolved around Middlesbrough. I loved the way the nation had come together in Italian 90. I didn't really have a choice after that trip. I thought I've got to waken people up to this and get people to see what other countries are doing or certainly what this country is doing because it was as night and day Janino said to me do you think that the biggest club in England he named Man United at the time they just started winning he said to me do you think Man United is training the same as Middlesbrough because he wasn't that happy with how Middlesbrough you know it was a bit of a culture shock a lot of the things here but particularly the training and for what I knew I knew that Man United were I mean uh, obviously our manager at the time had come out of Manchester United. Um, most of the clubs were, were more or less working the same way. And he found it hard to believe. He was coming from the, the club he was at, San Paulo. They were training most days, tw well, every day twice, some days three times. They were double world club, club champions just in that period before he came over. But he said to me, Simon, in the Brazil, you'll find that the, more, the most impoverished street, tiny club, favela club, is more professional in its approach to training than here and that was a bit of a statement to make and it wasn't actually quite true there was a lot of good work going on but I do think there was a, a lot of ignorance as well um, but when I went out there I saw what he was saying was was more or less true and I could only say first going there it was like you know if you've seen the film the Gene Wilder Charlie in the Chocolate Factory or whatever it is when you go into that factory and it's just like it was like that and I tried to, with everyone that I met, met, whether it was a coach, whether it was legendary player or young player, I asked for five factors as, as to why Brazil played as it did. And always in the first one or two was futsal or football salon, as they called it. And it became a priority for me to bring that here. At no point did I think or, think or hope that we copied Brazil or something like that. But it was this, in terms of the preparation, and they'd been doing it. I mean, if anybody studies back to the 58 World Cup, the Brazilians, in terms of the sports science side of it, were, as much as the Russians were in athletics, the Brazilians were peerless um, back in those days. So I know I went to root in, in saying sort of my, my sort of story as a kid, but I think it, it probably all relates that um, I liked a sort of artistic. In fact, there was an academic piece I looked at during my degree, which was, is sport art? A notion put forward by a guy called David Best, and I, I did a bit of an essay on it and said, you know, went up, went done. It should be rather than just the winning. And that that's how I, just my individual opinion, I saw it. And I saw the Brazilians did that, but they were also, at that point, and still are actually in terms of World Cups won, they were the most successful. And, um, you know, it's a long time in the game to be 90 odd minutes. And I think as well as the results, we, we should be entertaining. And uh, I know footballers swung away from that even more. But at that point, I was looking at, a, you know, a Premier League just coming off the back of it being the first division before it turned to the Premier League where the football at times was pretty you know pretty dull and uh, I didn't think most of the players could play it properly in terms of being able to pass it to control it and there seemed to be even issues with people saying that we should practice more in fact Alex Ferguson gives the example of uh, Cantona when he came into Man United and doing extra work in the afternoon and stuff and that led to Beckham and the rest of it doing it but it seems to me pretty obvious early on that if you practice at anything you're going to get better at it but these were the dark ages and even then people doubted that you could improve skills by by practice yeah but just on that when I was doing some research you've you wanted football to be an individual pursuit which you know, of course, like that creative piece, and that's that's the piece that lured me towards the Brazilian game. But when I look at my background and when I look at 
Northern Ireland, Ireland, Britain in the 1990s, the one thing that we pr- we prided ourselves on was that we would train harder and longer. But what you're actually saying is that the we weren't actually training harder. The Brazilians were were actually outworking us at that stage as well. Certainly weren't. We certainly weren't training harder. I mean, Arsene Wenger said in those days when he first came into English football, if these guys here could get the skill right and sort of the technical side and maybe the conditioning, the coaching, they'll be world beaters because the spirit that they've got is unrivaled. And I think that saw us through. But we weren't training hard. If you were around pro players back in those days, training was... And it went on it went like this for quite a bit after. It was more or less, you know, rock up at the club half past nine, something like that. You may be training half ten, finish half eleven, twelve, go home at twelve. Maybe only training three times a week. So... We were that far behind, I couldn't even think of a word for it in in those elements. And yet, in those days, people would say to me here, I mean, it was the start of me having debate with the FA about what I thought they should do. But, you know, the technical director at the time would say to me, our coaching is as good as anywhere. This is as good as anywhere. Our course is as good as anywhere. And um, I wasn't sure. Well, I knew that it wasn't. And so this became a bit of a mission to me. There's a great video of you in the news show around the 98 World Cup where you've got a two, three minute window to kind of explain what you're doing and, and where your vision is. And it's just, it blows me away every time I watch it, how dismissive the host is it, the host is of your ideas. How difficult was it to change those mindsets at that time? It was very difficult. Um, I mean, that when you mentioned that in terms of the host there, he was, he actually appeared to be a supporter to me compared to, well, <laughs> honestly, uh, in 98, 97, 98, 99, we traipsed round every club in the Premier League except for Liverpool and Arsenal who didn't want us to come. And I did in service or demos. It started off with Colin Harvey, Everton invited me. And I used to actually go and do a session a week for him, uh, 97, 98 time. Went round to others, you know, was met by some positive people, sort of, some not. But I think the... The establishment side of it was, uh, was you know, forget journalists. I think the establishment side of football, it was some of the most um, tricky stuff. I mean, he's a great manager and a great man, but Howard Wilkinson's response to futsal and what I was doing there was, he said, playing with a ball that doesn't bounce is no different to when we used to play with a flat football as kids and things like that. And it was just completely different days. And it created some sort of, uh, it created some, problems for us. I mean, it's obviously a, a, a totally different world now, but we just pressed on. We had, obviously with futsal, we had uh, cup competitions, leagues. Uh, we put it into some clubs. I mean, Eddie Leach and Dave Ryan at Man U, they had me in 99, started them off there at the cliff. They began. Uh, Tony Carr, West Ham, Dave Parnaby, Middlesbrough. You know, some, some really good people, but some attitudes that... Uh, at the time, I, I found hard to, to, to accept. And what you're saying about it being an individual pursuit in the beginning, again, I think we're in a different world, but pre-YouTube and pre the sharing information for kids, it was difficult to get kids out with a ball. Street football had died. Kids weren't out in the street anymore. Or too dangerous to be out, whatever, the, you know, the computer games coming a little bit. But um, just not the same culture we have today in terms of the ball, I think, and ball mastery. And... In Brazilian soccer schools, we wrote this sort of little syllabus, a skills badge scheme. I wanted to kids to first become master of the ball and then, okay, we can go off and play and we can, you know, look at the tactical side of it and all the rest of it. And, you know, some of the things that we put into our scheme were not match appropriate. They were more things to interest them so that they got repetition with the ball. Um, but again, I think that the, the technical piece then was one that we had to go at because I think on that we were particularly impoverished. Yeah, just on that then, there's there's clips of on YouTube of in your training of boys running through a, a little river up to their knees and then up hills. And I wondered if that was something that you did to challenge young players and move them out of their comfort zones or was it just something that you felt that we needed to improve in a physical way as well? Well, I did think we needed to improve on a physical way, massively. I felt that we needed to improve in all aspects. But that clip that you're talking about, that was with our 
trainees actually a few years on at Garford and we used to do these things on comfortability tests which were okay running in the lake up the hills I mean I think there's a lot of good you can guess out of hill running still so, you know two or three good outputs that come from that but um no, that was more just uncomfortability tests. We used to get them reading certain books and doing. And yeah, but the physical side of it, I, I did think we, we were also far behind on. You know, as much as we talk about England and, and we're, we talk about the progress and, you know, we're obviously, I think last night, another great victory and England are playing some brilliant football. Do we overlook the fact of how dynamic, quick, how physically impressive they are at the minute? Ah, they're unbelievable. Uh I mean, what's happening there is just uh, so pleasing. It's untrue and what's been happening the last two or three years with the youth sides, obviously um, what Gareth was able to do in the World Cup and just where it will go next. I mean, if there's a country at the minute that's doing it right, it's us in all aspects. I think on the coaching side, some of the ways that the FA have, you know, things like the, the youth modules that the FA had in, which they've now put into the case part now with the level one and two and the coach education side um i think in terms of st george's which is but it's not just st george's it's the i suppose the detail underneath that we're producing i think a generation of coaches here and players that um really will be the envy of the i think uh, of anybody in the world and there's been a lot of hard work that's gone on behind the scenes with people at the FA today, I think uh, the E Triple P's helped, um, but yeah, physically now we're we're right up there. In fact, I I think we're obviously going to have a great chance at the Euros, England, and then beyond that, I think this is a this is a it's just such an exciting time. We'll just take a little break there. Youth coaches, think about some of your biggest challenges. One that I frequently hear is the amount of time you have with your players. Have you ever finished the session only to realise that you really didn't progress to the point that you would have hoped or you'd have liked to? The challenge is exactly why we're excited to work alongside Sports Lab 360, a company with a great backstory and an even better product. As a coach, you can use the platform to make assignments focused on specific tactical principle. You can put in custom notes, track progress and scoring of your players as well. Coaches who have used the program report more productivity and progression in their training with players not only arriving more educated, but also with a greater desire to learn and grow on the soccer IQ side of the game. Sports Lab 360 are excited to offer Modern Soccer Coach listeners 15% off a club or team subscription with the code Roadshow Promo 1. Or send them a note and tell them that Gary sent you and get an extra week on your free trial. Thanks to Sports Lab 360. Back to Simon. When you coached Scarforth Town and, and you took this to the senior level, how much of the technical principles that that you embody and that you promote had to make way or become adjusted to the physicality and the nature of non-league football? Um, at first, not too much uh, because we had a great set of lads. Uh, initially, I, I mean, as well as buying the club, I took it on managing it in 2004-05 season and um, we encouraged the lads to sort of train a little bit more so despite the fact that they had jobs we trained three nights a week and some of the sessions would go on fairly late till half 10 11 o'clock um, now they might not have had the technical base of some of the players that we'd had um, in Brazilian soccer schools etc um, but they were willing to learn and to work and um, yeah, we got promotion that season and played nice football. We had Lee Sharp came into the team. Um, he just returned from playing in Iceland after he'd left Leeds United. Um, but then I ended up in Southampton the season after and it sort of stuttered it a little bit. Um, the season after coming back from Southampton, we got another promotion. Um, but then that season, um, getting into what we call the Evo Stick League, was a lot more physical and I think things did have to uh, change and I faced the reality that there's certain things in I think at that semi-professional level there's certain uh, yeah it's not always possible to play football um, I had ill health at the end of that season which took me uh, quite a bit to recover from and um, yeah I think it would have been possible if you get them in and do the work but um, 
in those lower leagues um, to just play. You know, I don't think you can just football your football your way out of them. How on earth did you get Socrates to come over and play in a game? <laughs> well, through through the work of of uh, that I done in Brazil, I'd got like a, a good group of players and coaches and people that I knew, and I think to try from a business side as well. Um, I'd launched the Soccer Tots thing, which Soccer Tots, my thinking of that was England related as well. I, I thought we can get an advantage by not going early specialization, but maybe giving children an earlier opportunity with the ball with some basic movements and thought of ABCs as well with that. Um, so I'd started the Soccer Tots, which ended up all over the world as well as, as, well as the soccer schools. Bought Garforth. I wanted a bit of an ambassador for it. And he ended up saying that he wouldn't mind doing a little bit of playing and coaching. And we we had Correcco over at another point, and we had Carlos Alberto, the great city captain who was a friend. He did a bit of um, coaching with us as well, but Socrates actually to play. So yeah, he turned out in November of 2004. Um, but yeah, he was a great man, and I was very pleased to have him associated with, with all that we were doing in those days. One of the most uh, outstanding people that, I've, that, I, that I had the privilege of meeting in my life. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm fascinated by him. I've, I've seen him in an interview a few years ago where he came out with a great, a great quote, those who seek victory are just conformists. So when I, when I was doing the research for this and I saw the press conference after the game, I was like, I was glued to it because like, there's got to be a nugget or two in it. And he said, what what Brazilians have that the British don't is creativity and a happiness in play. And, yeah. you know, we're talking about a kind of theme to this podcast is how much progress England have made as a football nation in recent years. But do you think we've moved away from enjoyment and that happiness piece, not only in England, but around the world at youth levels? I do. I think that we have moved away from that. I think the, the youth levels has, has moved away from it. But I think the professional, uh, so the top levels of the game too, um, only personal opinion, but I was, like Socrates, I was hoping that the game, game would maybe take a more creative slant. And I think the great work that Pep did at, at sort of Barcelona and is still doing now has had a massive influence on sort of football as a whole. It's sort of the style that we now see in the in the Premier League. There isn't as much to, uh, there isn't as much room for the individual, but I think in in world football too we don't have that. And I mean Socrates, he did his PhD looking at proposing that we move football from eleven aside to seven aside in order that that we now had more space. He said that the only way we could recreate the sort of the art the creativity, the invention of maybe he, he had in the era that he was playing was to reduce the number of players. Quite a radical proposal. Um, but I do think some of that has been lost. I think it, it's more lost more than ever maybe in the youth levels. Perhaps we're in danger of, of over-complicating things and over... Like a rigidity that's not the rigidity of the past when we, you know, we're talking maybe Charles Hughes and the sort of direct football or something. But if we're not careful, we, we could end up with a maybe an, a different type of rigidity. I'm obviously opening my eyes to different, you know, and every level of the game. And I see so much growth from when I was, again, we started the podcast out with saying that I had a fixed mindset about the game. I was technically inept and, and thought that was just the way it was. And now I see children that can do things that, that none of my friends could do. That was 20 years ago. But I have a three-year-old and we're now discussing with my wife, you know, what, you know, when to put him into soccer. and when. I'm not that thrilled about it, Simon. Like, I'm not dying to put him in because, not because I don't think he's good enough or anything like that, but I don't know if he's, if it's going to be an enjoyable experience for him. I, I do know what you mean by, by that. I think um, we have got far too serious with it. Um, maybe too young, but in my own coaching today and in the, interactions that I have with people, the happiness piece, I do think football should be fun. Um, that's why I began playing it. I maybe stopped playing it when it wasn't uh, fun for me. Uh, it's football in many aspects has brought up some of the happiest moments 
of my life. I think it has to be fun. And I think the creativity, happiness, I think the two come, the, the two for me were always linked. Um, but I think there is, there is maybe issues with that. Yeah. Um, the answer to it, I'm not sure, but just in your, in your own world and in your own working, I mean, my own coaching philosophy, I try to see that fun's always a part and hopefully being creative. Um, back in the sort of Brazilian soccer school times, we, we encourage kids, even if, you know, whatever situation with young players, we allow them to be creative and take risks in all, all parts of the pitch. Um, even in some, you know, we used to play academies and different things, even older age group, 15, 16, people dribbling out of the box or all the rest of it. I think that goes back to my sort of point on it being individual first. It's maybe a point not well expressed. I think at, at the beginning, it has to be just you making mistakes, things coming off, things not coming off, experimenting. It has to be that. And the, the more we can uh, sort of hold back the seriousness bit in terms of the age groups, I think the better. Um, I, I, yeah, I feel, feel strongly on that still. You know, a lot of this, again, a theme of this has been about moving mindsets and and then you know, looking at your journey, it looked as if the first mindset that you shifted was this opening up of growth mindset of, you know, technical ability of changing beliefs that we could actually, you know, do work better, work harder. And then as you moved to Southampton at the professional level, how difficult was it to change the mindset and change habits and routines during that stage of your professional career? Yeah, um, it was pretty tricky again. Uh, initially, it was Clive Woodward had recruited me. Um, the plan was that him and I would have at some point had the first team um, together. Maybe we were going to cut our teeth with the reserves or 21s as it was. Uh, I wasn't sure I could ever see the whole thing working. Um, had Harry was there, um, had Jim Smith and Dave Bassett came in to work with Harry. Um, yeah, I wasn't sure I could ever see it working and Clive sort of convinced me after a few no's. So when we turned up, yeah, we had done not a year, but uh, maybe nine months of preparation before actually going in. Some stuff with the younger players. Um, and uh okay we went in let's give things a go um i possibly should have been a little bit more patient and more um aware of what the politics would have would have uh, how things would have played out there but i went in a little bit like a bullet to gate as i tended to do in those days and so with the younger players it wasn't too hard to change things but uh a great group of players that were handed to Clive and I to work with on a daily basis, Theo Walcott, Gareth Bale, Alana, Dexter Blackstock, Nathan Dyer, Martin Craney, Leon Best, David McGoldrick, some great lads. Um, it didn't take us that long to get them on board. In fact, um, Nathan, Nathan uh, Dyer and Theo, maybe a little bit longer, after two weeks, they were with us and we got such a a good vibe going with that group. We did extra sessions with them, so we'd bring them in at 6.30 in the morning. Or we'd be there at 6, they'd maybe get there at 7. We'd do an early morning session in the club uh, each morning. Half past 10, we'd train with Harry, or if they're with uh, sort of scholars, do some training. Then we'd have them again on the evening at the same, I think the school was called St. Edwards or King Edwards, the same school where the academy used to run out of. And we'd do a final session. Some players even did a, a sort of a fourth session with me in the afternoon, an individual session. So they weren't too bad. On the coaching side, it was a bit difficult, you know, getting to grips with sort of coaching the reserve team and running that. It was um, tricky in some ways, some of the politics, but the actual, the, the lads, it was brilliant. And I kept in touch with some of those after and did bits and bats with them. Um, great learning experience. I mean, it, coming off the back of, I suppose, that which I'm saying with Janino, it was... In a way, it was still those sort of days that he was experiencing at Middlesbrough, although we were a few years on English football, hadn't been many. I mean, I was punitively given the title, as well as coaching the reserves as um, head of sports science, Clyde Performance Director. But there was a real resistance to, you know, if it was performance analysis, there was a resistance to computers, really. If it was 
whatever it was there was a bit of a bit of resistance um and but a good learning experience yeah i want to stay on that because i i feel like that's missing from coach education today sam and i think that you know everyone um, young coaches having different ideas or it's uh it's a bit of a think tank social media these days and there's people that are coming forward with new ideas and I'm, where i'm concerned is that as you come into environments that are driven by habit and routine of results and winning, it's very, very difficult to change that. So, you know, what advice would you have for a young coach who's gonna who's gonna come out fresh ideas, thinking that they can change the world from university or from their studies, and then coming into these environments? How would you recommend they navigate through that? Well, I know many of them who have, and I know some of them who are still doing it. I know people that have gone out to into that in a club, been chastened by the experience, come out and gone into academia. I think if you're going to do it at all, you've got to go gentle and you've got to go steady. And football, as you know, Gary, is a, is probably like all industries, it's a peculiar culture. Um, I think both on the playing and the sort of coaching area, with the coaching side within a club, you've got to be able to take people with you. And obviously, to do that, you've got to be very, you've got to go very, very gentle and very slow, um, and maybe pick the right club as well. Pick the right club to go into. Um, yeah, but not not an easy thing. But in those days, I wasn't personally. I was in a hurry to do most things, and uh, I just went to wanted to go. Wow, this is all going to change. And we had a sort of mandate from the chairman of the club. Um, I didn't consider enough how, you know, the sort of uh, the reactions of other people. I kind of thought everybody must be there. In my innocence, I thought everybody must be here to take this club forward and improve mm. the play. That's what I thought everyone was there for. Um, and of course, it isn't that. And you've got uh, uh, probably like any other industry. But if you're going to do it and you want to change it, you're likely going to have to go. You're likely going to have to, likely have to go, go steady. Yeah, it's funny on that there that what can be a strength in one area can also uh, make you vulnerable in another. So what what makes you valuable can make you vulnerable. So f- for me and in, in looking at your journey from a business point of view and from an entrepreneur bu- building or beginning a business with four young players in a soccer session and growing it to half a million young players around the world, you obviously wouldn't approach that in the same way. You know, you wouldn't approach that. Uh, you you go all guns blazing in that area what were the keys of your success so again you know in terms of approaching the game and and being a pioneer for brazilian soccer this was an era that entrepreneurship wasn't as cool as what it is right now and and business ownership wasn't as cool um how did you do that well i think once i'd been out to brazil and i saw that what janinho was telling me was was right i thought everybody's got to have access to this sort of work and training and I suppose my athletic background as well, go back to my degree, um, I thought that we were doing, you know, we could be doing so much better in football on the sports science side. And although it was Brazilian soccer schools, it was kind of, it was bigger than that to me. I wanted to, uh, I thought we could have a go at improving all aspects, as you said, the physical side, the lot. I mean, Brazilian soccer schools back then, our groups, we used to we used meditation, we we're big on nutrition, we nutrition diaries. Um, so I thought everybody, sh- everybody could get better. There's a chance of getting better with this. And so I set out a plan where I thought, okay, we'll take it to the country and then maybe it will help us get some money. We can feed that back here. Again, my I wanted English football to, to sort of benefit the most. I was interested in us having a better national team. So I, I just made a bit of a plan. I said, right, we're going to have the biggest impact. We're going to be the maybe the biggest soccer school in the world. I didn't doubt really that I could. So that would be one thing that if you, you know, look at something, have a a good look at it, argue against yourself, make a plan, look at best case scenarios and look at worst. Um, The big issue that I had at the beginning was, and I said this to Steve Sean, the guy from the BBC who made the first documentary on me, I said, he said to me out in Brazil when he saw some of the people I was in with and different stuff he came part with through that trip, he said, this could be really big, you know. I said, I realised that, Steve. I said, uh, and I have for a few months. Um, even before I went, I'd started to have this sort of 
biggest plan. But I said, I'm not sure if I go with it, what effect it would have on me as a person, which, um, you know, at times it was a very, it was a tough, tough ride for me. And um, so that my, if I had any reluctance, it was that. My wife kind of persuaded me in the end. She said, well, you, this could benefit a lot of people. Go for it. But I wasn't that sure of the, the fact, it, the effect it would have on my, my own personality and that type of thing, which some of it had a really bad effect, not good. Uh, so I was I was right in sensing that. But when I went for it, I went for it. Um, so self belief, you've got to have a good team because you can't do anything um, on your own. Had an unbelievable staff all my way through Brazilian soccer school, soccer tops with the club. Um, amazing franchisees, people that sort of bought into that. Early, you were saying, you know, you were telling me uh, your friend and sort of how you thought of that back in the past. You know, look at some of the people that came out. We've got Michael Beale, you know, I think one of the, that's some fantastic people. Uh, John Herdman, John, John, he runs the Canada. Yeah. You know, John John actually worked for me in my first soccer. He's one of my first coaches. Then it was a franchisee. Pete Sturgis was with, with us 10 years. Uh, I think Jed Davies, who I really admire. I love his stuff. Both his books. I think he did. We have some amazing franchisees. So you need a good team. Um... I think what probably what helped me out yeah, was I was very single-minded, uh, aggressive, and abrasive. I don't necessarily think they're good things, and I think some of the success that I had it made me arrogant, and ego is the enemy. Um, so that wasn't good. Yeah, okay, you have success and this, that, and the other, but I do try to go about things um, a different way today. And even if you have that success, you can have all of the success you want it isn't the be all and end all you you know you've got to stay if you can true to your own values um your family's everything you've got to be spiritually mentally psychologically on the right footing and um, as i went off into that sort of journey there was a guy from the times who was going to write a book with me a couple of years ago in 2014 it was looking back at what was then my 20 years in football um it was going to be called either The Revolution Starts Now or The Man Who Fought Football, as in fighting, whatever that meant. And I decided instead to sort of not do that and get on with leading the, the rest of my life in the sort of most productive and fruitful way that I could. But um, yeah, success isn't the, the be all and end all. And I think I did sense before I went into that that I probably wasn't old enough. When I began all of this, I was like Janino at the time and at the soccer schools. I was 25. I was very young. I was a millionaire by 28. That is no excuse, but players I work with today, you know, I use some of this with them. Um, I didn't respond to all of it very well and I didn't respond to success uh, in many cases well. So yeah, you can have success. You've got to decide first, do you want it? And um, then what's it for? I mean, yeah, your family, yourself, your sort of spiritual side of your life, um, all of that. I think in the people I worked with, they bore the brunt um, with me at times of being so single-minded and all that type of thing. And so I don't think any of that is, uh, is so cool. So if you can have success and not be like that, um, also the good but yeah i think 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 i believe like players i more or less believe most of us can do anything that we want that isn't the problem um maybe it's when we do it or we're doing it then what becomes of us uh can we cope with it and all of that so um yeah i don't know if that's a good answer oh phenomenal phenomenal last one for you what's your involvement in football at the minute and then kind of how do you view the game alongside that yeah, so the last few years I've worked with individual players. I've uh, got a group of pros that I work with. You might call this a mentor or something like that. It's probably not quite a mentor. It's, I just help a little bit with anything that I can help with. If it's not something I can help with, I can maybe signpost them to somebody um, who can. I love working with them. I've tried to, well, I do do it quite quietly. Um, it's very rewarding. I work with some younger players as well, um, which is absolutely brilliant. And I think when I was in 
Brazilian soccer schools, one of my friends at one point said to me, if ever you stop doing the sort of, because remember I began in under eights, nines, tens, actually coaching. He said to me, if ever you stop doing that side of it yourself or stop your connection with that, he said, I, I don't fancy your chances or I fear for you or something like that. In a way he was right. So I have got a group of younger players that we work with as well. And um, that brings me a lot. I hope it's also of benefit to them. I help some people in business on this and that, a few ideas. Uh, maybe you'd call it a consultant or again, a bit of a mentor. Then I work with some people in other sports. Um, yeah, oh yeah, and I'm doing some postgraduate work, which I've been on since 2000. And, well, I've been on it the last two years. And that is looking at in yeah it's yeah it's looking at players within clubs and kind of in an individual sense the provision that we have for them um 16 to 19 year olds is that right in saying that that's the kind of concerns that what you're saying there about your journey would be the same concerns of a young player to be like you know a success the drive and then the 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 difficulties that go along with that there helping them through that I suppose so. It, that would that would fit with it. Um, I suppose going back to you know with, with Janino and some of them. I mean, I although there wasn't much difference in age between me and him, I was able to help him with some stuff. Emerson was a, another player we brought in at Middlesbrough, became a friend, and so as friends, you just kind of mentor each other. But in all my time in football, um, I've seen quite a lot, you know, and I've seen it change, and but some some th things stay the same. I think the pressure young players are under, um, and some older players, is now with maybe with social media and with um, so the, the the game changes year by year. Okay, in the physical sense it changes, but in its appeal, in its sort of importance to the wider world, and I think um, yeah, we we just have to as much as we can. You know, young people look up to footballers and want to be one and all the rest of it, but sometimes it's um, you know, there's, there's, there's very tough bits of it, um, particularly off the pitch. Simon, thank you so much. This was uh, outstanding. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Gary. Thanks so much to Simon for his time and his insight there. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I just love that chat. Uh, I'll go back to saying, I think halfway through it there, about things that we don't talk about on coaching courses or don't really focus on in coach education. I wrote a few of them down. In the middle of that there, one was innovation, uh, the creativity and the ability to look beyond a fixed mindset. It's easy now to look at things that are wrong in the game or look at things that we need to improve. It's a different story to find solutions. I don't think we're as focused on finding solutions and thinking outside the box as maybe we would like to think we are. But back then in an era, and especially from growing up in that era and knowing what it was like, I, it was so difficult to get access to not only the information, but get access to people who could think differently and get access to sitting in front of people and change their minds. And Simon did an unbelievable job in doing that and physically going to Brazil and studying and putting ideas from that there and putting it back in the coaching community and challenging and supporting everyone. The level of perseverance that it takes to be successful. For me, a story that stood out was when he talked about how he could connect with Janino and sitting alongside his father at Middlesbrough Games and developing a relationship alongside him. And it's obvious that they became friends. He didn't just go to Janino and said, listen, I need to do this or I want to do this. He grew a friendship with him that obviously grew into developing his love for the game of Brazilian football and led to so much more. So I think perseverance on that and, and also when he went to Brazil and hearing about how he got in front of people, how he got Socrates over to play a non-league game of football in England, uh, like I said, it just absolutely blows my mind. The change management, your ability to go into an environment and change people's minds, I think is something that we should talk up a lot more about. And I think Simon's perspective and experience on that is invaluable for young coaches because it's easy sitting there and saying you've got these tactical innovations, but there is still a mindset in the game alongside majority of coaches at levels that it only works for X level. 
with that youth level or, or Man City or whatever it is, your ability to go in and work alongside them or collaborate alongside them to move them in a certain direction. And I worked alongside a coach a few years ago uh, in Cincinnati. I've probably talked about another podcast that was Nate, Nate Lee was, was unbelievable in change management and, and the amount of discussions that started off on a Monday where I would dismiss an idea and by two weeks later, he had me on board with it without even knowing that I'd moved on it. And yeah, I, I really liked his perspective on that there. And working alongside people is a great message to send. And then the last one, which could have been the most important one, is do we really look at the problems that success can bring us? You know, we, we picture this beautiful final destination that is going to be either with trophies or money or a position or a house or whatever that is. We don't really talk about what that brings from a negative side and that can also bring pressure from outside sources. It can also bring high expectations internally. But I thought it was was so powerful what Simon was talking about there about ego being the enemy and prioritizing your family and prioritizing your own personal well-being alongside that journey is just gold toss for a coach. And I don't know whether it's because I'm getting older or whether it's because I have a young family and and I start to think in that way, you know, if I did this here, does it come at a cost of X, Y, or Z? And and I think young coaches should be exposed to those decisions. And you don't want to go down a road where, you, you know, you go to or you end up at a certain place and, and you get there and you find out that maybe it wasn't for you or maybe you're not as happy as you would like to be. So I thought that was brilliant. Uh, Simon was a massive influence on me. I shared this with him after the interview that when I was a young, I was a business major in college. Uh, at Wingate University and I love the business side I love marketing I thought that's what I wanted to do as a young coach but I never saw the link between business and sport I never saw the link between marketing and sport and Simon was something that my dad sent over his football to Salo Brazilian soccer school booklets uh, when I was I think 22 sent it over to America and I'll always remember receiving it and it just opened my eyes to think there was a business model that could use with soccer and there was a way to, to coach and actually you know develop a career in coaching around that there and and once I became aware of that it spread towards then the, the Brazilian side of the game that I was a huge fan of and then it became more to like Simon's journey and being a little bit of an outlier uh, so he was a, he was a big influence on me indirectly, and I was oh, I was really keen to get him on the podcast. So really excited how it came out, and we'd love to hear your thoughts at Gary Kernin on Twitter, at Gary Kernin on Instagram. Have a great week, enjoy. Thank you for listening to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. For more coaching topics, sessions, and resources, head on over to Coach Kernin on Facebook or visit the website at www.modernsoccercoach.com.